That's what you get. <laughs> So is my face on there? That's too bad. I have a lot of material I want to cover today in reputation. Uh, and in the, the, our first 52 minutes and 40 seconds, uh, I wish to cover some theoretical information about arguments and how to test arguments. And I'm going to move from the most specific to the most general as time goes on. And then in our drill, we're going to confront a bunch of sample arguments that you have to Figure out what's wrong with them <coughs> quickly, very quickly, okay? And I'm pleased to meet you all here, you know. Actually, I'm, I'm dead, uh, and so I feel I'm better preserved when I'm in a meat locker with a temperature like this, so that explains why uh, we're meeting here, just to preserve me, because I'm going to start smelling after a few weeks if I don't. I uh, remain in the meat locker an appropriate amount of time. <laughs> I want to review different kinds of arguments and how to test them. First type of argument I want to talk about is an inductive argument. I-N-D-U-C-T-I-O-N, -D induction. And an inductive argument is where you look at specifics and you come to a general conclusion. You look at specifics, examples, and you come to a general conclusion. We do this in debate all the time. We do it a little backwards though, right? We say, oh, here's this general idea and it's proven by these specific examples. We do that a lot. This form of reasoning is extremely, uh, extremely popular. Uh, and the characteristics of induction, uh, and, and we use it all the time. We use it in uh, looking at historical trends, public opinion polls, social science research, uh, and most of what we learn in our life, we learn inductively. We learn as a little kid that when we stick our, our hand in the fire, it burns. Uh, all kinds of fascinating uh, information like that. And later on when we talk about deduction, we'll realize that deductive premises come from the process of induction. It was very interesting, someone was saying that Ridian doesn't trust induction. He really likes deduction. And I was like, yeah, well, where does he think these deductive premises come from anyway? They come from our observation of things. We learn, we look around, and then we decide that there are some general truths. Uh, you know, uh, we hope that the examples will be factual, right? In the kingdom of Oz, the wizard is a wonderful dictator. It's okay, so dictators are okay. That doesn't work very well. Uh, and usually, and I hate to break this to debaters, but single examples don't prove anything. Single examples don't prove anything. It, it happened once, right? Uh, for example, uh, you, may, you, you may see a dog and decide that dogs have four legs, but I just want you to know that in my neighborhood, there's a three-legged dog. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. We even have a two-legged dog. Its hind legs have been replaced by wheels. So you couldn't look at either of those single examples and decide a generalization about dogs. It, it, it often takes more than one example to prove something. The examples sort of have to be of the same type. Right? The examples have to be of the same type. If you're you know, deciding that uh, debate coaches are fat, uh, no. If you're deciding that debate coaches are thin, Right, and you took two examples of uh, Debbie. Well, you took one example of Debbie. I don't know if there's a second. Uh, and then decided the debate coaches were thin. That wouldn't really work because there's me and there's Steve and there's others. Right. So you need to take examples that are of the same type. You might need to do a survey, a representative survey of debate coaches, right, to decide whether they are thin, thin or thick or whatever. What do you do when you're confronted with an argument that is inductive? Well, first you, act, you ask, you, you know, there, there are several basic tests that you use for any inductive argument. The first is, are the facts true? Are the facts true? Right. In the United States, everyone is free. There is no discrimination. Look at Donald Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, Barack Obama, okay, 
right? There's no discrimination. There's no racism. Everything's fine. Well, you know, uh, Barack Obama has actually suffered quite a bit of racism in his life. I mean, he just went through kind of a racist campaign. I mean, it's okay for Sarah Palin to appear with a big gun in a picture. That's cool. Wow, Sarah Palin has a big gun and shoots it. If Barack Obama had appeared with a big gun, <laughs> right, that would be bad. It's okay for Sarah Palin's daughter to have an unwanted pregnancy, right, that was unplanned and unwanted. Oh, that's okay. Families face challenge. But if Barack Obama's children had had unwanted pregnancies, oh, look at those black people. They can't control their, <laughs> right? So the facts have to be true. Second, are the examples isolated or universal? Isolated or universal? Oh, marijuana legalization works great. Look at Amsterdam. Can you think of any reason why Amsterdam might be an isolated and not universal example? Because marijuana is legalized. What's that? Because yeah. marijuana is legal. Well, it's legal there, yeah, but the argument is that it, it will work in other places as it works in Amsterdam. Yes? Maybe because it's a very developed city and wouldn't work as much in a city with a lot of like, minority, well, they have minorities. Yes, so yes. Like, uneducated. It's not, a, like, it's not such a developed city. It's high, highly developed, that's one. The other one? Amsterdam had a very developed sea traffic, and uh, because of the cost of interchange, there were a lot of drugs in it, even before it was legalized. Sailors love to smoke dope. Yeah. It's also a very small nation. Yeah, it's a very small nation. It's also one of the most liberal countries in the world. In fact, I think it probably is the most liberal country in the world. Hey, I'm not feeling very well. Please kill me. Okay, cool. <laughs> right? It's a very, very, very liberal country. Okay? <clears throat> Third, do the examples cover a proper period of time? Cover a proper period of time. Well, in ancient Persia, marijuana was legal. Right? And in uh, Jamaica in the 1920s, marijuana was legal. And in Amsterdam, 2008, marijuana is legal. <coughs> is that good or bad that the examples come from uh, various periods of time? I think it's bad. Why? Different trends come and go in different times, so I guess when we are arguing at present time, we have to take present trends in around the world. Yeah, you're trying to argue for a present day legalization of marijuana, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that, that, that the emperor said Xerxes or Tiglath Pelissar IV said it was okay to smoke marijuana is not really the same thing as what we have now. Yeah, so re examples that are distant in history don't work as well. Right? Are there significant negative examples? Are there negative examples of where it didn't work? Right? If there are two examples of where it worked and two examples of where it doesn't work, hey, you know, that's a good critique of an inductive argument. Is the conclusion properly stated? Is the conclusion properly stated? You know, it works in Amsterdam, it works in ancient Persia, therefore it absolutely definitely will work now in New York City. Well, here you have the problem, the issue of the qualifier, right? It might work in New York City, but we wouldn't say from those two examples that it definitely, positively will work, right? Now, guess what? The team making the argument, do they qualify their arguments as, well, maybe it's true? No. no. They just say it's true, right? So it's your job in refuting these kinds of arguments to point out that this doesn't doesn't this prove it might work in some instances, but it's not a generalization, not sufficient. Okay. Type of argument number two. Oh, we are going to do so much today. Ad hoc, ad lock, quid pro quo. So little time, so much to know. Where is that quotation from? Yellow Submarine movie. Come on. Get in touch with your roots. <laughs> okay. Deduction. Deduction is a form of reasoning in which a conclusion is drawn from premises. You have premises that you accept. You accept two premises, you rub them together, and you come up with a conclusion. On the night the murder took place, Branca was visiting her lover in Split. Right? You accept that premise. 
How about this premise? You cannot be in two places at once. Therefore, the conclusion is that the murder that took place in Ljubljana was not committed by Branca. Right? Can't be in two places at once. She wasn't where the murder was, so she <laughs> didn't do it. What person do you know of that uses this kind of reasoning? Lawyers. Lawyers. I'm looking for a name. <laughs> what? Sherlock Holmes? Uh, no. Because Sherlock Holmes is an imaginary character. All right, Arthur Conan Doyle, there we go, the author of Sherlock Holmes, right? And this is, you know, many detectives sort of view this, well, if this is true and this is true, then this must be true or is not true or something like that, okay? Uh, and this kind of argument is used all the time in trying to solve puzzles and determining future possibilities. The classical deductive argument is all humans die, you are a human, therefore you'll die, okay? And then you'll have to be in the cold room to make sure you don't rot, okay? Humans, all humans die, you're a human, therefore you'll die. This is not how most deductive arguments are presented. Most deductive arguments are presented in a form called the enthymeme, E-N, this is a good one, by the way, for vocabulary, for and on your essays and stuff. E-N-T-H-Y-M-E-M-E. -M -E. That's where one of these premises is left out. I might say, for example, well, you know, all humans die, therefore you're going to die. I'll leave out the part that you're human. Or I might say, you know, you're human, therefore you're going to die. <coughs> Okay, I'll leave out the part that all humans die. And the Aristotle has called this the enthymeme, the body and soul of persuasion. This is where it's at. Okay, now why would it work better to leave one part out than to have all three parts? Go. Because then people get to the conclusion themselves, and if they get to the conclusion themselves, they grasp the idea much better. Absolutely. It's better to have people think things through on their own, right? Like they're a part of it. I mean, if you use all three, it sounds like I kind of think you're stupid, right? Well, you know, all humans die, and you are human, therefore you will die. Stupid, <laughs> right? But if you leave one out, the person sort of works through it on their own. And the studies show that arguments where people think through the argument on their own as part of the audience are much more persuasive. Now the problem that happens is that when the argument is presented as an enthymeme, as it usually is, and usually is in a debate, you have to figure out what the missing premise is, yeah. and you have to figure out if the argument still works. Now, wait a minute, what if the audience does it puts in a, the wrong premise but comes to the same conclusion? Is that okay? No. Yeah, as long, as long as they agree with me, that's what I'm interested in, right? So, so oftentimes, if even just if they're thinking through it but don't disagree with you, it's fine, right? They come to the same conclusion. <coughs> <coughs> they may have a strange reason <coughs> for doing that. I want to talk about three types of deductive arguments and tests for them. First is the categorical deduction. Categorical deduction. Probably one of the most evil arguments in the universe. Because this is the origin of most stereotypes Right? And we know that stereotypes can be very bad. Oh, you're fat, therefore you're stupid. Oh, you're blonde, therefore you're stupid. Oh, you're chert, therefore you're suave. You know, I mean, these kinds of, you know, all Roma people are lazy thieves. Um, all Americans are greedy, over-consuming. Right? All Slovenians are obsessed with punctuality. Montenegrins are... No, we'll just stop there. <laughs> I found Montenegrins to be very proud of their bandit heritage. We're proud to be descended from smugglers. 
So, you know, that it works for them. That's all I'm interested in. A categorical deduction is where you assert something about a category. Debaters are talkative. Debaters are talkative. Okay? And then you locate an individual thing within that. Okay? Miha is a debater. And therefore you conclude Miha is talkative. Miha is talkative. Right, faculty members at the University of Vermont have advanced degrees. Professor Wind Plenty is a faculty member at the University of Vermont. Therefore, <clears throat> she has an advanced degree. Okay? Now, there might be some problems with that. And here are the things you should think about with, with, with a categorical deduction. The first premise might not be true. Right, faculty members at the University of Vermont have advanced degrees. No, actually there's a couple of people in the business school who are there because they're rich, successful entrepreneurs. Right, there's a poet that doesn't have the advanced degree, but since he's won major international poetry prizes, they think it's okay for him to teach poetry. Right, so, you know, maybe Branca wasn't in split with their lover. Right, you never can, you know, if that premise is false, our whole argument's kind of falling apart. Uh, you know, the second premise might not be true. That she's not really a UVM faculty member. Maybe she's just hired to come on to give a lecture or so, as a guest lecturer. Right, not really a faculty member. You know, the conclusion might be untrue. The conclusion might be untrue. Debaters are talkative, Miha's a debater, therefore Mia is talkative. I don't know, Mia's been sick. And his voice doesn't work very well. And he hasn't been talking a lot, correct? Just not yes. <laughs> right? His voice hasn't been working very but well. Is that logical possible that you have two true premises and then the conclusion as well? Uh, well, yeah. all, I mean, the first premise might not be true for all. You could say debaters are talkative. Well, but then the, is it within the range of the, that the premise was incorrect? Yeah, I agree, but it makes the conclusion incorrect. Because not all. The reason the conclusion is incorrect is because the premise is incorrect. I apologize if I. Right? All debaters are talkative, but this is not how arguments occur. Those of you who have been trained in symbolic logic, you know, you're a devotee of Kopi. This is rhetorical logic. Right? The words are very slippery things. So they may say debaters are talkative. Why wouldn't they say right out front, all debaters are talkative? Then, then you have to think about biology. Yeah, you would think about, are there any I know that aren't? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Miha is kind of quiet. Sir? Uh, when you say that, you kind of leave room for error. You know, you can, well, if somebody comes up with a negative example, you can say, well, I can see all right. talkative. Most are. Right, right. And this is why these the categorical deductions are so evil. Right? People are making broad generalizations. They're making people think that they said all when they didn't say all. And then, of course, you have, oh, well, you are, you know, black, therefore you must be lazy. Right? So that it's, it, you know, leads to a lot of vicious conclusions. Okay? All right, so think about that. Now, if you are testing this argument, if you are testing this argument, you would say, first, is the first premise true? Is it true what they say about the group? Is it true of all of them? Some of them? Just a few of them? Most of them? And this is the issue of the qualifier. Right? And remember, the other team doesn't usually put the qualifier in. So, you got to get there for them. Right? And is, is Miha really a debater? Right? Does he belong in that category? Right? Well, I'm not talking about Miha uh, Andrić sitting here. I'm talking about, what's the name of the guy who's the host for Tecma? Shalihar. Miha Shalihar. Yeah, Miha Shalihar. He's, the, he's definitely not a debater. Even though his name is Miha. He's a TV star. Not really, but 
He, he thinks he is. Okay, so you have to make sure that the specific you're talking about is in that group. And then you have to put in the proper qualifier. Type of argument number two, disjunctive deduction. Disjunctive deduction. This argument looks like this. Two possible outcomes are outlined. One is negated and the other is affirmed. Two possible outcomes are outlined. One is negated, the other is affirmed. Often you identify this argument by the terms either or. Maybe your father was upset with you once once and he said, look, it's either my way or the highway. Right, either do it my way or get out. Right, very popular parental argument. For example, for you to pass this course, you must either study harder or the professor must become more lenient. The professor will not become more lenient. Therefore, in order to pass, you must study harder. All right, instead of my reading you the tactics for refuting this kind of argument, let's take this example, okay? You either have to study harder or the professor becomes more lenient. The professor will not become more lenient. Therefore, in order to pass the, the, the course, you must study harder. What's wrong with that? <coughs> Go. This kind of argument is usually wrong that uh, sometimes, oh, actually most of the time, there's a third solution. Right. Basically doesn't uh, force it. Yeah, what's our third solution here? Cheating. You could cheat. Yeah. What else? <laughs> You can withdraw. You wouldn't pass the course if you were true, but. You could bribe the professor. Actually, that's a way to make the professor more lenient. <laughs> you can right? also try to debunk a premise that professors will not become lenient. Yeah. yeah. Right? You might, you, you might find a way. Do you know, do you, can you think of ways to make professors more lenient on you? You can talk, you can talk, you can explain why, why you can study more. Well, no, there's some really easy ways. Don't you know this technique? You learn to talk like your professor. You figure out the words they use, their speech patterns, and then you talk to them and use their words and speech patterns. And because you sound like them, they assume you are smart. <laughs> right? You know, figure out the words they use most often, use those words, make sure you have them. Right? Try to sound like them. There are other, way, other ways to ingratiate yourself to the professor. Wait a minute. Do you think that you could suck up to the professor and study harder? Yep. Right? It's not a question of or. You could do both. I mean, quite often in the debate, one side says, no, we have to do this. And the other side said, no, we can't. We have to do this instead. And it's like, uh, 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 we could do both. Right? I think always a very, a very interesting uh, thing that you should go. But don't they like always say like what well, I mean I've always heard it take like a hard line. People always position. say nothing. Sometimes they might say, go ahead. Okay, like a hard line position rather than like because I mean if, if one side says something and the other side but isn't that I mean that's what they're supposed to do, like you know, clash. If you say we're doing both then there's not gonna be any clash. Or there's no room for the clash. Well no, it means that it means that the clash they're calling for is artificial. One team says we need to hold parents responsible. The other team says we need to have social services, right? Are the possibility of social services mean that we shouldn't hold parents responsible? <coughs> no, we can hold parents responsible and give them social services, right? So that would work to the detriment of the opposition team, right? Quite often the opposition is saying, no, we have an alternative, but it's not an alternative. And if it's not an alternative, it's not a reason to vote against the proposition team. Yes? It's kind of a mental flaw for debaters, for example, when the opposite team gives us two possibilities and we think that it would be better if we, if we just stick to their game and say, no, 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 you should, the professor should become lenient and then try to prove because we presume it is only one option, which according to me is like the most wrong thing to, to do because you do not always have to <coughs> oppose what the opponents say in order to win the argument. Yes, I, I think that, that too often the debate degenerates like, you know, um, religious belief uh, is the enemy of intercultural dialogue. 
right? And so I judge this debate in practice and it becomes one side says religion good, the other side says religion bad, right? And it's so, it's totally simplifying the debate. And it's so easy to take control about that debate. Said, no, it's not about whether religion's good or bad. It's about religion's role in, in sharing culture, right? And so religion can be good, but it can interfere with intercultural dialogue. Right? And so, you know, these, I think it's very important to examine that they might do both. Type number three, hypothetical deduction. Uh, by the way, I teach a whole course on this that's a semester long, so if I seem to be drifting over some things, it's because so little time, so much to know. Hypothetical deduction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to distinguish this from cause, by the way. Differing conditions can influence the outcome of something. Differing conditions can influence the outcome of something. It's an expression of a hypothetical or conditional relationship. The key word to look for is if. If. If Branca is not there to coach us, we will not win the tournament. Branca is with her lover in the split. Therefore, we cannot win the tournament. Okay, I know you find that one to be too strange. Let's try this one. If it had rained, the ground would be wet. The ground is not wet. Therefore, it did not rain. Okay, this is an if then. If it had rained, the ground would be wet. The ground is not wet. Therefore, it did not rain. Okay. How would you refute that argument? Yes. There could be a roof over the ground. Yeah, there could be a roof over the ground. Not all ground is open to the sky. Maybe it was covered up <clears throat> right, by a giant flying saucer. Other reasons. Go. Uh, city clean with the water. Yeah, the city clean. I mean, they they were washing the street. There are other ways the ground gets wet. One more. Uh, it could be really hot right after the rains. Yeah, it could be really hot and the so the water disappeared. Okay. These are particularly these can be particularly weak arguments because in most social phenomena, why do things happen? Do they have one reason why? Is there only one reason why the team might win the tournament? Branca? Branca? No, there are other reasons, like they might, they have to speak, they have to think, they have to debate, right? Branca's just one part of it. And it's quite often the other team will identify one part that's not there or they're going to put that part in and say that makes everything work. That's a problem. The thing about these deductive arguments in general is that they don't necessarily occur like one, two, three, or one, three, or one, two. Right, in the terms of an enthemy. Often they get strung together into long chains. Well, all lawyers are human, and all humans are vertebrates, and all vertebrates are animals, and all animals are mortal, and therefore... All animals are... All, all lawyers are immortal. I don't know. Right? But if you have this long chain of arguments that fit together, many different links to lead to one conclusion... What's the best way to defeat it? A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So you don't need to destroy all the links. Do they have to make all the links? Yes. What happens if they leave a couple of them out? What can you do? Yeah. Well, point out that they left them out and then break some other links, right? So I mean long... You know, drawn out arguments like this are fairly easy to pre easy to disprove. You show that they've left out an important link, and then you break one or two, and they're done for. Causal reasoning. Causal reasoning is next. Causal reasoning. Event one leads to event two. One thing causes something else. 
One thing causes something else. Usually it's, you know, we know a cause and then we speculate the effect. We know that cigarette smoking can cause cancer. Therefore, while you're standing outside smoking, we tell you, you might, I know you don't want to hear this, get cancer. All right, don't do that. All right? Don't smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. It'd be bad for you. All right? So that's one form of cause like We know a cause, we identify it, and we say it will happen. Then we have effect to cause. We have effect to cause. Ah, I see that uh, somebody's mother has lung cancer. Therefore, she must have been a smoker. Right? This kind of argument happens. I mean, we're going to critique it in just a minute. Don't worry. All right, we have effect to cause. Then we have effect to effect. We have a known effect. We discover a cause. And this leads us to a new effect. I know that seems really weird to you, so I'm going to give you an example. I read a book by Truman Capote. I liked it. I liked it. So I decided to read another. I read a book by Truman Capote. It had an effect on me. Right? It caused the effect of pleasure. Right? So I decided, let's have a new effect. Right? Let's, let's, let's read another. And maybe I'll get that pleasure again. Very common. When people do things that they find pleasurable, they tend to do them over again. Repeat. Repeat. You have to be careful, though, in terms of all these causal arguments as to whether you're, you're looking at a cause or a sign. A sign is an indication of an event, not the cause. Sign observed. Oh, this sign is associated with the event. Therefore, the event is true. Birds are flying south. Birds fly south when winter is coming. Therefore, winter is coming. It's nighttime. The rooster is crowing. Roosters crow when dawn is coming. Therefore, dawn is coming. All right? It's a sign that something happens. Now, don't think, you know, the sign is not the cause. If we kill the rooster, the sun will never rise. Right? Oh, my God. Don't kill the rooster. Right? Or in... June, you see birds flying south. Quick, quick, bring in the crops. Winter is coming. Right? A sign doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. There are seven warning signs of cancer. Right? If you have one of them, that doesn't mean you have cancer. And if you have seven of them, it doesn't mean you have cancer. It means that it's a sign that you might, might have cancer. Absolutely. Here's some things to think about when testing causal arguments. Number one, does the alleged cause have the power to produce the effect? Does it have the power to produce the effect? Right, Bill Clinton becomes president. The economy gets better. Therefore, Bill Clinton caused the economy to get better. No, he didn't really have the power to do it. It happened, it started happening before he was even elected. Right? He might have had the power to do it, but even though he said, it's the economy, stupid, every morning by looking in the mirror, that doesn't mean he caused it. He didn't have the power. Right? If your parents teach you good morals, does that mean you will have good morals? No. No. They can share moral ideas with you but they don't necessarily have the power to imprint them on your brain. Okay? Uh, 
Boyana and I have one major argument between each other. It's quite serious. It's the effect of the cross breeze. Her mama told her that when the wind blows this way across you, it makes you sick. Right? It says, you don't believe me? Ask, ask Slovenians. Ask many Balkans. They agree. The cross breeze is bad. I still don't understand why blowing this way is bad and blowing this way is not. See what I mean? Like, what's the what's the plausible? What's the what's the power that the wind moving this way has? There is an argument. Ah, because only when it blows across does it affect both ears. Uh. <laughs> Shh, don't tell Boyana that argument. Got a out of that. Two. <laughs> is this the sole cause, or there are other causes? Right? Did you get lung cancer because you smoked cigarettes? <coughs> what are other reasons you might get lung cancer? Secondhand smoke. Living in Iraq. Oh, li li you know, breathing, breathing nuclear waste. Yep. <laughs> Coal mining. Your occupation. Your job. Uh, your mother was a smoker. So what does that mean? Secondhand smoke. Yeah, it might be genetic. Some people are genetically susceptible to cancer. All right. Third, is this a significant cause? Is this a significant cause? Right, if I smoke one cigarette a week, it's quite different than if I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Right, what's the, what's the power of the cause? How much is the cause there? Fourth, is this the original or the contributing cause? The original or the contributing cause. Now, getting pregnant. Right? There's probably really one cause. What is it? That's a contributing cause. See? What? Intercourse. Intercourse. Eh. Contributing cause. No. The union of the egg and the sperm followed by implantation in the uterus. Just because the sperm and the egg get together doesn't mean there's going to be a pregnancy. Right? It has to implant in the... That's the deal. That's it. Without that, you're set. No pregnancy. No prego. Okay? But there may be contributing causes, like all the ones you mentioned first, love, intercourse, rain, <laughs> what, rain, rape, okay, alcohol, right, so, so if you hadn't got so drunk, Right? We wouldn't have had this union between the sperm and the egg implanting in the uterus, right? Because you would have said, boy, if he's too ugly for me. But you know, after a few drinks, what do they say? Beer? Helping, helping ugly people get laid for, you know, since 1501 or <laughs> Five, are there counteracting causes? You know, don't let them name the contributing cause as the cause. Five, are there counteracting causes? Counteracting causes. Something could have stopped it, right? Like the, my mother used to say that all girls should uh, hold a piece of aspirin between their knees. And then they won't get pregnant. <laughs> or you might use a condom. Right? Or some whatever herbal family thing that they use over here in this primitive country of Slovenia. <laughs> right? Counteracting causes. Something stops it. And six. Has coincidence been mistaken for causality? Has coincidence been mistaken for causality? Like Bill Clinton becomes president, the economy improves. That doesn't mean he caused it. He just happened to be there at the right time. Right, George Bush becomes president. The Twin Towers are attacked. He just happened to be there. 
I don't, I don't want to attribute, I, I want to attribute as little agency to George Bush as possible. And after that, all hell broke loose. Okay? Now, there are some arguments which are types of arguments which are branded as fallacious. How many fallacious arguments do you think there are? There are an infinite number of fallacious arguments. Just like, do you think there are two sides to every issue? No. How many sides are there to issues? An infinite number of sides to every issue. Right? I love, you know, I, 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 should, have, I should have asked those questions in reverse. And I'm sure somebody would have said, oh, there are two sides to every issue. That's where you're wrong. Okay, some things are just fallacious. Now, we have identified types of arguments that are fallacies. And we've done this not because, you know, they're fallacious, but because they sound good. They sound good. Right? They sort of sound appealing. So, you know, here's a few that I, wa I want to mention to you. Okay, and then in our exercise, we'll... I'll show, we'll show you a list of arguments from American presidential campaigns that commit all of these fallacies. Okay? Fallacy of composition. What's true of the part is true of the whole. Bones are part of you. Bones are hard and brittle. Therefore, you are, you are hard and brittle. All bones are hard and brittle. All bones are hard and brittle. Therefore, you are hard and brittle. No, because only part of you is bone. What's true of the part is not necessarily true of the whole. Likewise, you have the fallacy of division. What's true of the whole is not true of the part. Right? Conservatives limit government intervention in the economy. Therefore, George Bush will limit, who's a conservative, will limit government intervention in the economy. Not 800 billion bailout. Right? What's true of the whole is not necessarily true of the part. Okay? Next one I want to talk about is the straw person fallacy. Quite common in debate. I'm sure you've seen this. They don't attack your argument per se, but they, well, what they're saying, what they're really saying is, then they misconstrue your argument, then they answer the misconstrued argument. Right? I, if I see someone and I think you're doing that, no, for, right? Because I think that's like a, a, really a high crime. You misconstrue the other team's argument. For example, uh, no, I don't want to use that example. It's on my list. Okay, the straw person. Now, where does this name come from? Well, which would you rather have a fight with, a real person or a straw person? The straw person. They don't fight back very well. You can rip them apart. And then they threw my legs over there. And then they threw my arms over there. Where does that come from? Wizard of Oz, right. Don't watch out. When winged monkeys attack, you run. Okay? Circular reasoning. The conclusion is a restatement of the claim. The conclusion is a restatement of the claim. If I told you how I found out, you would all know who told me. Sounds good though, right? If only, if guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. Yeah. Wow. Right? Also called a truism. Also called a truism. Uh, there are some simple ones like avoiding the issue, talk about something else, attack the person. Yeah, and you got a big nose. Right. Anybody in here from Venezuela? 
you know, the political art, you know, there, there's, there's very strong divisions in Venezuelan society. And, the, and I really respect all the people who are here because they really want to make sure that there's a culture of rational debate in their society. And I think that's great because too often it's like, oh, you disagree with me? You are evil, stupid, and ugly. <laughs> right? And that's about where it goes. Don't attack the person. Shift in ground. Shift your ground. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. This is famous second government speech. Oh, no, we weren't proposing that. <laughs> what we meant was... Right? Then they shift their position. <laughs> Seizing on a trivial point. Seizing on a trivial point. <coughs> <coughs> this is called waving the red heron. In English, you know, I, the reason I think you, you, you need to know that phrase is that, you know, if some Brit is judging and you say they're waving the red herring, the other team will go, well, what are we, what? <laughs> but the real will, yeah, that's how, oh, yeah. <laughs> right, that means you're seizing on a trivial point and talking about it over <laughs> and over again. The most famous trivial point of the 20th century was but they might be communist, right? Especially if you lived in America. It was like, oh no, we have to support dictators in El Salvador because <coughs> the, <coughs> the other side might be communist. We have to <coughs> send rockets to Iran because at least they're not communist. We have to, you know, we have to go to the moon because if we don't go to the moon, the communists will go to the moon, and we can't allow the moon to be communist, right? You know, it's like, you know, totally red herring. Now, I finally found out where this comes from, okay? Now, herring, as you know, very popular fish, you know, throughout history because you could preserve it and keep it for a long time. Uh, and there's one kind of herring, when it's processed a specific way, it becomes very red and it's very stinky. It smells really bad. And when explorers were investigating North America, there was a real problem that the wolves would find the parties of explorers and follow them and then attack them at night while they were asleep. Very serious problem. Uh, but if you leave a little red herring along your path, the wolves will come up to that and go, whoa. We're not going that way. <laughs> right, so it leads you off the track is why it's called a red herring. Uh, a bunch of these we already talked about, false dichotomy. You can either bring your lunch or walk to school. You choose. Uh, I think I can do both. Appeal to ignorance. Failure to disprove something is not proof. This is very, very popular in conspiracy theories, right? The Bilderbergs are a group of rich people who rule the earth and they control information and they're in charge of everything. Well, I've never heard of them. See how good they are. <laughs> See how effective they are at hiding themselves. <laughs> Appeal to the crowd. Appeal to the crowd. This is called the bandwagon effect. But daddy, Everybody's getting Satan tattooed on their arm. Right? But daddy, all the kids at school are smoking crack. Right? Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. Uh, now, although I'm running out of time, this is a great historical example. Here's where that, that comes from. In, in American politics, before mass media, it was very hard to reach voters. So... Branca is campaigning for office. She goes to this small town and she hires a wagon and she puts in that wagon a couple of guys with musical instruments. And there's a sign on the side of the wagon, come here, Branca, speak. Right? And so the, the wagon drives around the town and, you know, the music's playing. Says, okay. And so people jump on the wagon. It goes to where she's speaking. They get off the wagon. Wagon goes out again gathers more people. Now when you get to the site of the wagon, they start serving you cheap liquor. Right? And so more people gather, they get drunk. Really, this is American politics throughout most of the 19th century. 
You know, and then by the time Branca speaks, they're all oh, pretty drunk, right? So when the bandwagon's full, you know, oh, I need to get on the bandwagon. I bet there's some good booze at the other end, right? So the more people are on the wagon, the more people want to get on the wagon. Okay, there's all this is also the source of the original uh, phrase about I'm on the wagon or I'm off the wagon. Have you heard this phrase? When you're on the wagon, you're not drinking. And when you fall off the wagon, you go back to drinking. See, words come from somewhere. Uh, appeal to emotions. But what about the children? It's not about the children. It's about whether you can save them or not. Appeal to authority. But Boyana says, right? The no substitute for reasoning. Appeal to tradition. Women have always been in secondary positions to men. Right? That doesn't mean it's a good idea. It doesn't mean we should continue to do it. If we always stuck with traditions, you know, we'd be meeting in probably a colder cave than we already are. <laughs> Appeal to humor. I can't answer your argument, so I'm going to make a joke. Fascinating joke, sir, but you're not answering the argument. In stand-up comedy, you're winning. In debate, you're not. Ambiguity and equivocation, use different, use words differently, define words. We're not increasing taxes. We're enacting revenue enhancement. <laughs> right? It's not... Right. Yeah. Technical jargon. Oh, we'll just reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. Right? Typical Star Trek. Technical jargon. Post hoc fallacy. Wow. I heard Tuna's lecture and then I did better in the debate in the afternoon. Eh, it could be that you maybe weren't so hungover. I don't know. Right? Bill Clinton got elected and the economy improved. Right? The full Latin word for this is post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. Right? The rooster crowing did not make the sun come up. Damning the origin. Damning the origin. Well, I can't answer your argument, but I will make fun. I will make fun of Serbia, which is where you come from. Right? Or I will make fun of Slovenia, which is your... Well, what you would expect from a small backward country like Slovenia. I would expect them to kick your ass in the debate. Wishful thinking, right? Oh, but if we all just close our eyes and think beautiful thoughts, Tinkerbell will come back to life, <laughs> right? But hope, we have to always hope. I mean, we can't show our proposal will work, but let's try anyway. <laughs> Lip service, that's where you do one thing and, 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 and say another. You do one thing and say another. What? How's Lip service. George Bush is openly, verbally opposed to budget deficits. Right? The other word for this is hypocrisy. Right? That's like my saying, whatever you do, get lots of exercise and don't eat too much. Cultural bias. Cultural bias. Right? Different cultures have different things. Just because it's a value in one culture doesn't mean it's a value in another. Okay? Now, in this society, if the women came to breakfast with, uh, with their breasts exposed, that would be a cultural no-no. Okay? But in Polynesia, the breasts exposed is fine. It's the navel that has to be covered. Now, is one right and the other wrong? No. They're just different cultures, right? So that, that doesn't mean you can say, oh, you know, they can, they can enslave their women if they want in Iran. That's fine. That's their culture. I think you, you, that might be going a bit too far, right? But just because, you know, America is a leading democracy. America has a two-chambered legislature. Therefore, to be democratic, you have to have two legislative chambers. No, that's cultural bias, right? 
Ronald Reagan saying that all democracies have to be designed after America. It's nonsense. Cultural bias. Uh, demand for perfection. But your, your proposal won't save all the children, so why bother? Okay? Because we're going to save some of the children, dummy. Nothing but objections. Uh, you know, this is a question after the debate. Does the opposition need to have an alternative? You know, you're trying to determine where we go to lunch. Shall we go here? No. Shall we go to lunch here? No. Shall we go to lunch here? No. Shall we go to lunch here? No. So what do you say? Well, where the hell do you want to go have lunch? <laughs> right? What's your alternative? And wh however you go down on that issue, I think it's not a bad idea to say, you know, to make the opposition challenge them to, to provide an alternative. They may not take up that challenge, or they may argue they don't have to, but it keeps them busy. <laughs> and they're all trying, if they don't have one, you can say, well, we save children, they don't. <laughs> Plus, it makes your argument that if we save just one child, you would vote for over what we have now, you would vote for us. Okay? All right, take minutes. 13. And then come back. And some of you, if you're lucky, will be able to leave this room. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Cool, Let's go out there and okay. we'll look at some. In, in, in the uh, war. In the war. Maybe. We're in the sun, there's some war. <laughs> Some. I didn't have any problem, but then I was speaking, so I just burn a lot of calories. Here, I'm just a list of arguments, and but one problem is there are also. 